Psalm 23. What is I said? I saw no one make me a lie down a green path. So lead me a path likeness for name's sake. Yeah, yeah, I walk to a valley, shallow death, and fear no evil. Thou art with me, and what is that they come to me? I will pass your table for me, and ready to air my enemies. No one is my head with oil, my cup running over. Glory, yeah. goodness, and mercy, and follow me all days in the life, well, and the house of the Lord forever. Maybe we should be motivated to memorize Psalm 23 after that, right? I am not sure, though, that I could say it with the same attitude, but wow, that is so amazing. Anyway... Here we go. Last week we started talking about the statement, the Lord is my shepherd, looking at the 23rd Psalm. So this week we're going to explore the next part of that passage. And today the, 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 the title would be, the Lord is my provider. In fact, let's read verses 1 through 3, okay? It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David says, God is my shepherd, I shall not want. In fact, one translation says, I will lack for no good thing. So, when the shepherd watches over me, then I will not lack for anything. He is my provider. Would you say that out loud with me? In fact, write it in the chat. God is my provider. God is my provider. Come on, write it in. The all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present one who loves me, he is my provider. He provides so many things that the psalmist tells us. In fact, let's look at a few of them. The first thing that the psalmist says is that he's, he provides resources that we need. You know, I shared this, I think, earlier on, on a Tell Me Something Good. But my son recently moved out of the house to live a couple hours away in order to go to college. And, you know, uh, I won't tell you that um, how distraught I was over it. But my son was really stressed out because now not only is he paying for his own college, but he's also having to face paying just to live, right? I mean, he's no longer in dad's house where dad's footing the bill for everything. Now he's got to think about paying for college. He's got to think about paying for food, paying for rent, paying for utilities. And let me tell you something, he was stressed out out okay it's like welcome to the real world sir and, and and so he was thinking how is he gonna pay for all this how is he gonna make it he didn't think his savings would take him through it so he uh, he decided that he would look for jobs he finally just landed on I'm going to transfer from the company I'm working here I'm working with here in Santa Clarita I'm going to transfer it to, to working for them in Orange County well, the problem was that he's a manager up here. There are no managerial positions for him in Orange County. And, um, and, and so they tell him, listen, you're basically going to have to start as just one of the workers on the floor. And not only that, but in Orange County, the minimum wage is lower than the minimum wage in LA County. So he's really like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Not only do I have more bills, but I have less money. Can somebody go, yes, yes, yes. I feel that I know it all right so he he was saying he said dad pray pray with me please I, I need I need help so he comes on this idea that he's going to ask the management uh, the the store if they would be willing to keep him at the same pay scale that he is here that they would be willing to pay him the same there even though he's not going to be a manager so after much prayer, he goes to them, he asks them, and, and um, finally they call him back and they said, well, Ethan, yes, we'll do that. Right? Can you believe that? He got the same pay 
and even got a raise on the top of that because of all of what God has been doing in his life. So listen, here's the deal. The truth of the matter is that God the shepherd provided for him. All right? Now here's the thing. Even if God had said no, or even if the, 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 the company had said no, we're not going to do that for you. He had no reason to stress because the shepherd would have provided in another way because God is the provider. The contemporary English Bible says it this way. You, Lord, are my shepherd. I will never be in need. Listen, the shepherd is our provider. We will never be in need. Say it again, I will never be in need because the shepherd is my provider. I will never, I will never be in need. And we're not just talking about material things either. Not only does he provide resources, he provides rest. The, the psalmist says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He makes me rest. You know, I want to explore that a bit. That God makes us rest. Because, because the shepherd knows me so well, he knows that I need time to rest. So he makes me lie down. Now, how many of you know that work is worship, okay? That when we work, it's, it's part of worshiping God. But what we fall prey to is the idea that it's noble to work all the time. Yes, work is worship, but working all the time does not equate to worshiping all the time. There, there's a balance to be made. You know, when my kids were babies, we used to require them to take naps and to go to bed early, right? My son was okay with it. He loved his naps and, and, and he loved to go to bed early. But my daughter, well, no way. She was always fighting. No, daddy, I'm not tired. No, daddy, I'm not tired. I don't need a nap. I don't need a nap today. And what would ultimately happen every time is that if she didn't take a nap she became overstimulated she got really really cranky or should I say crankier no she'll get I'll get in trouble for saying that so she would get really cranky and and she would just be a bear to live with right because she was she was tired and she insisted though that she knew better and that she didn't need a nap so what her mom and I would have to do was make her rest because we knew what was best for her, right? Imagine you going to the doctor and he informs you that you have a lifestyle that's leading you to an early departure. Okay? His prescription is, listen, you got to watch what you eat now. I think it's, your food is killing you. No more sodas, no more fast food, no more donuts. Ugh, I don't know if I can do that. In fact, he says, if you continue eating that, the way you're eating, you will die in three months. So what do you do? You go home and you think to yourself... This doctor doesn't understand my life. He doesn't know what I'm going through, and I can't do that. Let me ask you a question. What's going to happen if you don't listen to the doctor? You're going to die. Pure and simple. And, and listen, God, the doctor shepherd, knows that without rest, we will self-destruct. Because he, the creator, created us to need rest. And somehow we think that rest is for losers. So we don't want to rest. And, and the omniscient God who loves us dearly has to make us rest. He makes us lie down. There are so many times that God has to put you on your back because he knows what's best for you and you're not following the prescribed rhythm because the truth is God has created a rhythm of rest and work author Mike Breen talks about working from your rest instead of resting from your work you know immediately after God created man God rested he set in motion a, an example for us in fact man's first interaction with God was from a place of rest and then he went to work and we've got to learn that when that, that we work from rest and not rest from work rest is important our bodies need this cycle of rest daily monthly yearly and, and what has happened is today we've come to believe that rest is for the weak it's for the poor and it's for the underachievers and if we take time to rest then we are less than we're pansy and that attitude pervades everywhere. It's encouraged in so many insidious ways that rest is for the weak. One of the best, one of the places we see it the most is in sports. Man, athletes are celebrated for destroying their bodies and playing instead of resting when they need to. And sportscasters hail them as heroes when they don't rest. 
Man, that's not the way it should be. God demonstrated the importance of rest in the creation schedule. He reiterated it time and time again. In the Ten Commandments, is a good example. He says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The idea of the Sabbath is that it was a day set aside for rest from work, and it was devoted to spending time with God. It is not just physical, it is emotional and spiritual. Listen, I know how many of you know people who rest from work on the weekends but are stressed out because their, their weekends are filled with so many details and activities that leave them emotionally spent and physically exhausted. So for many of us, what needs to happen is the shepherd needs to make us lie down. He makes us lie down. But I want you to look at where he makes us lie down. Come on, man. Even when he makes us do something, look at the love with which he does it with. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Let's go back to the sheep for a second. You know that sheep will not lie down if they are hungry. Sheep don't lie down if they're hungry. So when David says that he makes me lie down in green pastures, there's also the understanding that I have eaten and that I'm satisfied. I lie down now amidst the abundance because I've gotten all that I've needed. You see, I think too many people don't lie down when they're filled because they think they need to keep going. We have this idea of I have to make hay while the sun shines, right? All of this abundance, I need to keep doing stuff to save it up for the rainy days. And the problem with that mentality is that it reveals our lack of understanding about who is our provider. Say it with me one more time. God is the provider. God is the provider. And he has provided for me. And now I can rest. Yes, we're going to get hungry again. But the omniscient one knows that. And when it's needed, he will provide for me again. I can rest because he is the one who provides. You know, the children of Israel kind of learned this when they traveled in the desert. You know, you ever, you ever thought about it? How can millions of travelers be sustained in a desert? I mean, you understand that they're on the move all the time. How do you feed, how do you sustain millions of people on the move in the desert? Well, God provided. He provided for them. And he provided through something called manna. I want to read to you from Exodus 16. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In, that, in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Wow. And God provided bread from heaven for the people so that each day they were fed. Wow. But, but I want you to know, I find this instruction really revealing as to how God wants us to handle his provisions. Look at it with me. We are only to gather what we need for that day. No more. And we hate that approach, don't we? That daily bread approach maddens us because it makes us have to rely on God daily. And we don't like that. We would rather that he gives us this big lump sum that we can hoard up so we don't have to constantly trust him for daily provision. And I find it interesting that this daily provision was not just to take care of them, but also to test them regarding their willingness to obey him. Man, listen, I have found that our obedience to God is directly related to our trust in Him and His Word. Did you hear that? Uh, our obedience to God is directly related to our trust in Him and in His Word. If I believe God is all-powerful and can provide for all that I need, then I will obey Him when He tells me to take only what I need. All right? Because I believe the shepherd will ensure that I will lack for nothing. You know, one of the places that a lot of people t struggle with in this particular instance is with tithing. Because tithing really is an is issue of trust. Who is my provider? Who is my provider? God says, if you give me first, I will take care of all of the rest, right? And not only will you have what you need, but you will find rest amidst the hustle and bustle. In the Old Testament, God speaks to the people because they're not willing, they weren't willing to put him first and trust him to provide for them. And he describes what happens to us when we don't trust the provider. When we, when we think, oh, I don't know, I got I to gotta take care of myself here, okay? I want to read to you from Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says this, take a good hard look at your life, God speaking. He says, think it over. You have spent a lot of money, but you haven't much to show for it. 
You keep filling your plates, but you never get filled up. Mm? You keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on layer after layer of clothes and you can't get warm. And the people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted out bucket. That's what. Hmm. Can anybody go, man, I know exactly what you, you're talking about there. I know what, what they're saying. It's like I work, I work, I work, and it seems like I, I don't get any rest and I need to do it more and more and more because I think we forget who is our provider. God says, trust me, I am your provider. Follow my ways and I will provide for you so much so that you can rest because you are filled and taken care of. Look what happens when the people didn't trust and obey. Okay, I'm reading, uh, continuing in Exodus 6. It says the Israelites did as they were told, picking up the manna, all right? Some gathered much, some little, and when they measured it by the omer, he who got, gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little didn't have too little. It, it was just enough. Wow, God does that. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. But in the morning, it was full of maggots and began to smell. See, here's what happens when we don't listen to God and we don't trust Him and we're trying to hoard up instead of just trusting in Him and laying down amidst the abundance. All our work is in vain. All that we gathered uh, and wasted time picking up will get eaten by the worms and become a stench to us and to those around us. See, too many people don't lie down when they're filled because they think they need to keep going. But I also think that sometimes we don't rest because we don't see the abundance as abundance. We're looking for a filling in something else. He makes us lie down in, amidst the abundance, but sometimes we just don't see the abundance around us. We take the abundance around us for granted, and we want something different. We despise the abundance of God, actually. We think we need something more than what He thinks we need. Let me read to you from Numbers chapter 11. Continuing with the, uh, with the children of Israel, and, their, um, and, and, and we're talking about God providing to them for them with the manna, okay? And, and He provides every bit that they need. They, never, they have always just what they need, all right? So now, I want to pick it up. One day, some worthless foreigners among the Israelites became greedy for food. And even the Israelites themselves began moaning, We don't have any meat. In Egypt, we could eat all the fish we wanted, and there were cucumbers, melons, onions, and garlic. But we're starving out here. We're starving, and the only food we have is this manna. Okay, verse 31. So, so some time later, the Lord sent a strong wind that blew quail in from the sea until Israel, Israel's camp was completely surrounded with birds, piled up about three feet high for miles in every direction. The people picked up quails for two days. Each person filled at least 50 bushels. Then they spread them out to dry. But before the meat could be eaten, the Lord became angry and sent a disease through the camp. After they had buried the people who had been so greedy for meat, they called the place graves for the greedy. See, here's the thing that happens. Some of us are not rested and we die because we don't recognize or we despise the blessings of the Lord. We are greedy for something else. We think we know better than God about what's going to make us happy and satisfied. You know, I, I don't just want a Toyota. I need a Lexus. I can't just have Hanes t-shirts. I must have Calvin Klein's. I can't just have a Whirlpool refrigerator. I must have a Mila. Yes, I know. Go look it up. Yeah, goods. So here's what happens. We're not satisfied with what God gives us. So we go into debt to get what we don't need to impress people that we don't like. And then we can experience no rest at all because we have to be working all the time to pay for this stuff. So my question is, are you lying down and enjoying the provision in the moment? Or are you insisting on working instead of resting? Because beware, God may make you lie down. So God provides resources. He provides rest. And He also provides refreshment. The psalmist goes on to say, He leads me beside quiet waters. You know, 
There's nothing I find more refreshing than a, and satisfying than a glass of cold water on a hot day, right? When you come out from working out or, you know, wa working in the heat or whatever. I mean, sure, I love a cold Coke or sitting in an air-conditioned room when it, coming out of the heat, but nothing satisfies more than water when we're parched. And the water is beneficial to us as well. And here in this psalm, David says, The shepherd leads us beside quiet waters. Quiet water is water that has been stilled so that the sheep can drink. Because you see, the truth is, just as the sheep will not lie down when they're hungry, they will not drink from fast-flowing streams. So sometimes what the shepherd would do, would temporarily he would temporarily dam up a, a stream so that the sheep can quench their thirst. The verse can probably be read as, He leads me beside stilled waters. Man, it's such a picture of peace here. Even, even the stream that God brings us to, He takes care to still it so as to provide complete rest for us. Or the, the picture that the message gives is that in cases where He doesn't dam up the stream, He finds quiet pools. Here's how the message says it. He says, You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. And what happens is that it restores my soul. All of this rest and refreshment leads me to restoration and not just physical restoration. See, when I drink from His presence in my quiet times, my spirit is restored. My perspective is renewed. My soul is revived from the crud and the crap that is stuck to it. Man, this cycle of rest requires daily being renewed in His presence and weekly being renewed in His community and in corporate worship. And I'm not just talking about singing either. I'm talking about the idea of, of being renewed by ministering to one another when we come together and praying for one another, encouraging one another, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to God. Man, the good shepherd, he finds us places where we can be restored. He brings us into places of great abundance where we could lie down amidst being filled up. And he brings us to quiet streams. Listen, when we spend time daily in God's word and in his presence, it's the quiet waters that he provides for us to drink from, a place to find refreshing. Kind of like streams in a desert. Hmm. We should name a church after that or something. God also provides a route. He provides direction. There's a God's path and there's God's path and there's our path right and God's path is the righteous path it is good it's tried it's true it's a pathway that will lead us to his destiny that he has for us the problem though is sometimes we think we know better than God we think that we are we are the omniscient omniscient ones and you know probably the most famous last words of most humans are well that didn't go the way I thought I've been seriously telling my kids that that's what they need to put on my tombstone. Because the truth is, we think we know better than God. And then we go do it, and then we end up saying, well, yeah, that didn't go the way I thought. Here's Proverbs 14, 12. says it in a little bit different way. He says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. We want to go off the path he set before us, and usually it always leads to trouble, to injury, to danger. The message says that same proverb this way. He says, <coughs> excuse me. There's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. In a later psalm, David emphasizes the goodness of God and the sureness of his path when he talks in Psalm 145, verses 16 through 20. He says, You open, my hand, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is fair. In all his ways and faithful in everything he does. The Lord is near to everyone who prays to him. To every faithful person who prays to him. He fills the needs of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and saves them. The Lord protects everyone who loves him. And he will destroy all the wicked people. And because that is the case, here's what our response should be, okay? Let me just real quick, because God does all of this for us. Shouldn't our response be as in Psalm 25, Make your ways known to me, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, because you are God, my Savior. Or Psalm 86, Teach me your way, O Lord. You're getting the picture? I will walk and live in your truth. Direct my heart to fear your name. 
So he leads us in paths of righteousness. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not lag for anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me besides paths of righteousness. Here's the next thing I want you to hear. For his name's sake. And can I tell you that the health and safety of the sheep reflects on the shepherd, right? It reflects on the shepherd. God's reputation is on the line. And whether we like it or not, you and I are living epistles. We are the demonstration of his power, his love, and his provision. We are the portraits who portray his peace. Now, the truth is some of us claim to be God's sheep, but we don't heed the shepherd's voice. And we end up being battered, worn down, attacked, wounded, right? Do you think that if we disobeyed, then it's the shepherd's fault? I don't think so. But the truth is that many of us give God a bad reputation because we have disobeyed and run away from him and, and not followed what he's asked us. And then when the bad stuff, ha stuff happens, we blame him. Or the people watching our lives say things like, if that is what happens to the people who serve God, then I don't want no part of it because God is not a good shepherd. It's for his name's sake. He leads us in the right path. And if we follow it, it brings honor and glory to his name. Listen, I wonder, are we being good sheep? Because the shepherd is doing all that needs to be done. What is it that we're saying in his name's sake? I want to bring it home to you today, okay? There's some questions for you to consider from our exploration of God is our provider. I wonder how many of you are weary and run down because you've been trying to be the provider instead of letting God provide. You're not resting. You're not resting. You feel like you got to be the provider. you got to be the one that, that is responsible for the miracle of provision. And you're not resting because you feel it's all on your shoulders to pick up as much manna as you can. And then you find out that no matter how hard you try, it just slips through your fingers. And now all you have to show for it is being weary and burned out if that's anybody am I speaking to you today and you need to to really live out God is my provider it's not me I'm living in abundance but God is my provider I'm gonna let him provide I don't know is there someone today who's missing the blessings of the Lord there's somebody listening you can't lie down because you think you need something more than what he's providing in order for you to be happy you're surrounded by the blessings of God, but you just can't see it. Can I encourage you to stop, look around you, and see the green pastures, and stop thinking you need something else? You are despising the abundance of God, waiting for something else. Start today by counting your blessings. Why don't you take a moment right now and just begin to look at all the amazing abundance that God has given you right now. And be resting in it. How many of you, you're not walking in the pathway of righteousness that God has shown us? We are walking in our own way and it's leading to frustration, it's leading to wounding, it's leading to anger and to bitterness. We've got to trust the pathway of God's word. We've got to trust the spiritual leaders who are there to help you when you're in doubt about the pathway. Because in all of this, we are representing the shepherd. And we do not want to be guilty of taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Listen, when we declare that God is our shepherd, when we declare that God is the Lord of our lives, and then we do not follow him, we are guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain. And the reputation of the shepherd is dependent on the obedience and health of the sheep. So my question is, are we building the reputation of the shepherd or are we destroying God's reputation? And if you are, then you need to confess that and ask for forgiveness and walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. For someone listening, and for all of you, the shepherd loves you. He loves you. He is the one that wants to provide for you. He provides everything you need. You don't have to look any further. In fact, there are some of you, you don't even have a relationship with God. And the shepherd knows that you desire that. He built you that way to come and be a part of his family. We couldn't do it on our own because 
The Bible says we're born in sin, and no matter how we try, we can't reconnect with God because we are just sinful and can't do it. But God loves us so much that He even provided a way for us to be cleansed of our sins and brought back into relationship with Him. And that's through His Son, Jesus. God sent His Son, Jesus, who was without sin, to come to earth, to live as a man, to walk in our shoes, and then He became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So that now, because of Jesus, you and I can come back into relationship with God. And it's very simple. I believe that God is calling to so many of you. I want you to come back into relationship with me. And it simply starts with accepting the fact that you're a sinner. That you cannot cleanse yourself from sin. You need outside help. Accept the fact that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the one who can save us because of his, his life, death, and resurrection. And then call out to him. Confess your sins and ask, him, ask Jesus to be your Savior, the one who forgives you of your sins, and ask him to be your Lord by giving him the right to tell you how to live your life. And if that's you today, would you take a moment? In the chat, there's a little box that says, I want to commit my life to Jesus. Click on that. Give us the chance to be able to pray with you and con connect with you and help you walk through the next steps of your walk with God. If you're listening on YouTube, take a moment to go to desertstreams.com, click on the prayer requests, and send us an email letting us know you want to commit your life to Christ. We would be more than happy to just walk with you through all of it. Listen, remember, God the shepherd, the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God loves us. And he wants to provide for you. Live in that reality this week. Blessings to you.